Well, good evening, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Stringer Lamar. I'm the managing director of Fortis Consulting London, and I have the honour of being the chairman of the Institute of Directors here in the City of London, IOD uh, City of London. Welcome to you all, and thank you very much for joining us here uh, this evening. A special welcome to Janet Thomas, President of Women in Banking and Finance, and also, I'm told, a double alumnus of uh, Cass Business School. So that is a good thing. Also to uh, Leonard Spectreman, who is the Treasurer of uh, Central uh, London branch of the IOD, and also a particular welcome to Sheila Needham of uh, Needham Griffin, who is a past IOD City of London committee member and was with me and uh, Paul right at the beginning of this series. So good to see you here um, as you're right here at the beginning and obviously keeping an eye on things. So, so that's always good. Now, obviously, um, this is a joint IOD City of London and Cass Business School uh, event, and we always look forward to it. It's our annual event. Now, that being said, we were also here on Monday evening um, because we had a joint event between Cass Entrepreneurs Network and IOD City Young Executives Group looking at women and, entre and entrepreneurship. We're definitely very pleased this evening that two incredibly top uh, women have agreed to participate uh, in this uh, evening and the conversations. So obviously, Lady Barbara Judge, National Chairman of the Institute of Directors, who is definitely providing very positive and energetic leadership to the organisation. I thank you for it, Lady Barbara. And also, Professor Marianne Lewis, who is definitely a top educationalist and I know works very hard at further strengthening the links between Cass Business School, the city, the rest of the UK, and indeed all over the world. So excellent that you can both be with us here uh, this evening. Now, quickly, just some comments about this thing known as the IOD. So the Institute of Directors, a national uh, organisation, over 30,000 members. IOD City of London has just over 1,000 members. We cover the City of London, no surprise there, but also uh, Canary Wharf. We have a strong focus on financial services, professional services, and a very deep interest in international uh, trade. We have four special interest groups, China, property, financial services, and the one I've already mentioned, uh, the Young Executive Group. We're a very strong supporter of diversity, certainly believing that diversity of thought is a very good thing and essential for the health and well-being of business. I'm very pleased to share with you just some data I've got that now IOD City has 20% of the membership are women. Obviously, we want to increase that. Out of the large branches, that means we're number three uh, in the UK, and it's actually been an increase of 30% in five years, one of our key targets. 19% of the branch membership are under the age of 40, which makes us number one uh, in the UK, and that's certainly testament to the very hard work of the Young Executives Group. And that's actually increased by a formidable 86% uh, in five years. Now, obviously, diversity goes in line with inclusion. So should you not be under 40 or a woman, we do take people slightly older and the other group known as men. So uh, that's perfectly fine. Now, if you're not a member of the IOD, you have about one hour to figure out why when I ask you later on during the reception. No pressure whatsoever, of course. Now, I've not been um, told of any um, fire alarms uh, this evening, so the exits uh, are at the back, and I think there's two just behind me. Is that correct? So should the alarms go off, please uh, act accordingly, and please do remember, this is an IOD City of London event, so leave elegantly, stylishly, and possibly talking about business uh, on the way out. I've just remembered something I'm going to tell you now as well. Please, would you turn the, uh, the, the sound uh, systems off on your mobiles, please? Um, certainly feel free to tweet... Um, LinkedIn, uh, and all the other uh, available sources of social media. And I would just like to formally finish this bit by thanking Cass Business School, as ever, for their great support in this programme and providing what I think are some of the best facilities of any university, uh, certainly here in London, if not the UK. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my very good friend, Professor Paul Palmer, Associate Dean, Cass Business School. Well, good, evening. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's always hard, of course, to follow David, as you probably know. You should never follow success. Um, but uh, a very warm welcome uh, to you all here at CAS. I, I did actually say to Sheila uh, and to Gary, the, the, the deputy chair, this does feel like a reunion now. So it does actually feel more like an alumni <laughs> reunion uh, than anything else. So thank you for those very warm words, David. Um, a couple of things on CAS and, and, and the wider university uh, before our, uh, moving on to our main act of the evening and, and a few comments. Um, uh, the probably two most, most uh, interesting things that has happened within the academic year. Remember academics, we work to an academic as opposed to the fiscal year or the, uh, or, or, or the calendar year, we work to the academic year. And probably the two most interesting things that have happened to us um, is first off, this is actually the 50th, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the business school. The business school is the second oldest business school by o only three months actually we're the second oldest, but some other place uh, got, got there just before us. Uh, second oldest business school school in the United Kingdom. And it is always interesting to reflect on what was said about the business school at the time when it was created. And the comment, of course, was, why did we need a business school? And certainly was a comment, why did we need another business school? Because uh, actually management education in the 1960s in the United Kingdom was absolutely, uh, was absolutely seen as something that was actually taught on the job, and you actually didn't need a university or a business school. It's appropriate, the reason I say that is because, of course, our dean, Marion Lewis, is American from the United States. The oldest Collegiate Business School is the Walton Business School, established over 100 years ago. And of course, the reason why business schools were established in 1966, those of you who remember the white heat of technology of the Prime Minister's comments of the time, was that there was a real feeling that one of the reasons why the UK had fallen so far behind the US was because we lacked business schools and managers who actually understood. So it's important to put that into context. The second point is that the uh, thing we're celebrating is the university. Now, of course, there is a view that academics don't merge, uh, go too fast. And so the other thing is that the university, after being in discussions since 1922, has finally joined the University of London. It's been an interesting courtship. Uh, and the papers are, are interesting of the various conversations that were had. Uh, it reminds you very much of a courtship of will she, won't she, will she, won't you, will you join the dance, for those of you who remember Alice in Wonderland. And, uh, and that was pretty much the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the conversations. At times, Castle, uh, City University wanted to join the University of London, the University of London did not want City, and at other times, the University of London wanted City, but then City said it didn't want to join. So um, it has been an interesting long court. The reason why I say that is, is that, of course, to me, the importance of a business school is about applied education. It's about, and nothing further, if you like, brings you away from that is the often prediction of business schools, of universities as ivory white towers, right? This lecture really does bring out that classic what we've been searching in which the whole history of CAS has been about and certainly through Marianne and her predecessors over the years many I've actually served under five deans in my time um, has uh, is an interesting one because actually all of us said the same this is about an applied business school and very much asking you to come in and share a knowledge exchange with us rather than we telling you what we think so on that very basis it's an interesting format tonight first off I wanted to say uh, David you will note the word in conversation this is an, an, a slightly departure from our normal format where we normally have a formal speaker and then questions some people have already expressed to me a concern will there be questions at the end <laughs> yes there will be questions at the end okay so I just wanted to clarify that and on that basis now I hand over to my boss uh, Marianne Lewis and a warm welcome Marianne <laughs> Well, it is a pleasure to be here. What a wonderful evening. Um, I, I do want to add a few comments about CAS, but very short because this is really a, about the conversation and particularly with Lady Barbara. CAS is a, a special place. I've been privileged to be here as Dean a little over a year. And in particular, because our focus is to, we say, enable the extraordinary. And that might sound bold, maybe it's because I'm American, but it's really about transforming leadership through the fusion of knowledge creation, education, and community engagement. And a night like tonight is a beautiful example. Because I look out into to all of you, and you can see academia and industry, theory and practice. I see students and alumni and practitioners from across different industries. That's a wonderful opportunity. But even further, 
it's to learn with and from extraordinary leaders like Lady Barbara Judge. And if I may, to give you some background, and many of you probably have some idea of her remarkable um, history to date, and it just continues every day. First we have, she is the first female director of the IOD, but also, and maybe more personally to us here at CAS, she is a visiting honorary professor at CAS. She is also a treasured strategic advisor, mentor, and friend to me. And I am very grateful for that because there's nothing like learning from tremendous experience. So let me give you a sense of her experience because I do think it's remarkable. She is a leader of many firsts. So for example, not only is she the first woman chairman of the IOD, she was the youngest person and only the second woman ever to be a, made a member of the US Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And in that time in particular, as I was looking through it, and Barbara, I had no idea of this. For example, she helped persuade Tokyo, specifically the Tokyo Stock Exchange, to open its doors to foreign members. What a remarkable achievement. She then moved to Hong Kong later, became the first female director of Samuel Montague, the British Merchant Bank, and I could keep going with first, but let me add, she has been UK Atomic Energy Authority, chairman of the UK Pensions Protection Fund, and in 2010 was awarded a C CBE for services for, and I think this is particularly interesting, uh, services to the nuclear and financial services sectors. Just think about the breadth of there, of that, um, but remarkable. So as Paul said, this is going to be a conversation. I'm just gonna get it started to make sure that we save plenty of opportunity for all of you to engage in that conversation. So with that, please welcome Barbara to join me. turning on the mic. Am I ever lucky that I met Marianne? It is the nicest thing that's happened to me in a really long time. And she says I'm her mentor, but I just think I'm her friend. And that's the biggest privilege and honor to be, to be her friend. And whoever's here from Cass, you are really lucky to have her as a dean. She's a total star. Total star. <laughs> okay, now let's shift it back to Barbara. But thank you very, very much, Barbara. I think as a starting point, when we think about leadership, it, it really is a journey. It's, it's, we look at our career and probably, especially when we look backwards at our career, it's always a fascinating, strange, curve, curved progression. We know, I just said that you've been awarded a CBE for nuclear and financial services, but you began as a lawyer. Can you give us a sense of why there? That's an interesting starting point, looking backwards. Well, that's true, I guess. Can you, can you hear me? Because I don't know if, it's, if this is on. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. So it's the true story of how I became a lawyer is, do they still ask little children what do you want to be when you grow up? Do people still do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I was a little girl, and they used to ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said, I want to be an actress, because I was in the school place. And when my mother heard that, she was infuriated. She said, we are not having any starving actresses in this family. If you want to act, go act in front of the jury and be a lawyer. <laughs> and that is how I became a lawyer. I had no idea what a lawyer was. I'd seen it on television. There was a program called Perry Mason. Did they ever have that? Uh -huh. Remember Perry Mason? Uh -huh. So that's what I thought a lawyer was. And that's what I was. She told me to be it, so I was. Because she said, if you're in New York, and you can clearly hear that I'm from America as well, you had to be a singer, a dancer, and an actress. And I as my mother pointed out, couldn't even sing in the shower. So <laughs> that was bad. And what she also said to me, just interestingly, was if you do become an actress, what will happen to you is you will spend all day auditioning for jobs that you will not get. And you'll have to spend all night working overnight to get the money to pay the rent for your apartment. So I, whenever I did what my mother said, I got it right. I didn't always do what she said, and therefore I didn't always get it right, but I did become a lawyer quite like that accidentally. The footnote to the story is, when I was practicing law two years out of law school, two years, she also said, just for the students that are around you, you have to get the best grades you could possibly get, because if you didn't, you wouldn't get a job. Because in the late 1960s, when I'm talking about, 
There were no women lawyers in most law firms, none at all, zero. Anyway, that's another story. But the nice story about my mother is two years out of law school, two years I'm, I'm in my firm, it's about one o'clock in the morning, because that's what lawyers in America worked in, and I'm dictating to a, to a secretary, because it was, be, you know, it's before the age of computers, you were dictating. And this secretary is so beautiful. She's the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. And I said to her, what are you doing taking my dictation at one o'clock in the morning? And she said, oh, Barbara, I'm a lawyer. I, I'm sorry, I'm an actress. I'm an actress. I spend all day auditioning for parts that I will not get. <laughs> so I have to work in the steno pool at one o'clock in the morning to take your dictation. And I thought, thank you, mother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's remarkable. Well, I, I mean, I think I, my next question uh, that, that brings me to, I mean, it, it builds on the comments about your mother. I, I've heard you, you talk to our students in particular, like at the London Symposium for our MBA, about the power of mentors and sponsors. Um, and I've also heard you say, you know, it's our role as leaders to be pulling people up, pushing people forward, identifying future leaders. What do mentors and sponsors mean to you? I mean, that's a different, different people have different lenses on that. That's true. That's absolutely true. So I thought that my only mentor, well, it's a long story. A, my mother, I need to say, my mother, is, if I have any small success, it's about my mother. Mary and I have to do that. Mm -hmm. My mother taught women to work in the, in the 1950s. One more point. Does anybody ever see Mad Men in this whole time? Mm -hmm. Nobody saw Mad Men? Yeah. yeah. Oh, kind of tell me. <laughs> okay, do you remember what Mad Men was? You remember that blonde in the beginning of Mad Men? Because what, what used to happen in the 50s and the 60s in America was what you were supposed to do as a woman was go to university, find a cute guy, marry him, live in the country in the suburbs. He'd take you to the suburbs. You'd have two children. He'd go off to the city and work, and you'd stay home all day. And he'd come home at night, and you'd be dying for some adult conversation. He was too tired. So she thought that was really boring. And she thought women should work, not because they were poor, not because they were alone, but because they had a brain. And they should use it. And they should make their own money, because money was independence. So that's why she told me the story of how I had to be a lawyer. OK, so now get back to your question, Marianne, which is, and she worked till she was 88 as a dean in a college. And when she was, after she was 88, she retired. And now she has dementia because she had, didn't have to get up in the morning to go to work, so she didn't get up. Um, so I used to think she was the mentor. Uh, she was my mentor, and I did ask her questions about my life. Because the story of mentors is mentors talk to you, mm. and sponsors talk about you. And there's really a difference. A mentor mm. is a person with whom you have a personal conversation. They may tell you about talk about your life, they may talk about your career, but they're talking to you, okay. right? A sponsor talks about you. Now, I, I worked for eight years in my, seven years in my law firm for a guy, a man, who was very powerful, very, very smart, but he liked to work till three o'clock in the morning. And he wanted me to work right next to him till three o'clock in the morning. And I later learned it's because he was more powerful in the office than he was at home. So much to stay in the office. But I worked for him even though he was really mad. I mean, if you gave him a piece of an acquisition agreement, I was an acquisitions and mergers lawyer, he'd say, Barbara, that's two spaces off center. Do it again. Oh. I remember in the 70s, doing it again was not so easy. Or you'd write acquisition agreement, he'd change it to purchase and sale agreement. Next time he'd write purchase and sale agreement, he changes it to acquisition agreement. You couldn't do anything right for him. But I used to get, I worked for him on purpose. And you know, I put myself in the way of his business to do this jobs. And my friends thought I was totally mad. And they said, Barbara, why are you working for this fat man? And I said, well, it's because I think he's a good person. I just think he's a good person. People didn't talk about ethics and morals in those days. Good was about as good as it got. So I spent these seven years working for Fred till one or two or three in the morning going mad. And I wasn't the first woman in my law firm. I was the second in the firm. <laughs> And the other woman was a, quite a bit older than I was. But finally, they made her a partner in the firm. And that was when I was in my seventh year of practicing law. And when they made her a partner, 
I was thrilled for her. I was thrilled. I loved her, and I was so glad to see the first woman partner. The first one, yes. But I knew it was over for me. I knew it. There was no question. They were never going to make another woman partner. So I was going to leave. And my friends all said, stick around. You know, you can't even be considered for partner until you're eight years out of law school. So just spend another year, right? You know, one more year. I said, OK, because I didn't really want to leave. So I stuck around till the eighth year. And then I, it was the first year I could be up for partnership, right? And this is what I am told happened in the partners meeting, but I don't know for sure. Pardon me for standing mm -hmm. up, OK? The partners meeting looks like this, right? And there's a podium. And Fred, my friend, remember the guy I was slaving away for all those years? He gets up on the podium and he says, we do not need another woman partner in this firm. We have one, and one is enough. Maybe more than enough. But we need a good acquisitions and mergers lawyer. And we have Barbara, and we should make her a partner. And that is how I became. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Now, I always thought that Fred was the mentor. Indeed, that he was the only mentor that, other than my mother that I ever had. But I was wrong, actually. He was a sponsor. Because later I learned, actually not so many years ago, that sponsors talk about you. Mentors talk to you. And I promise you, I used to ask Fred personal things, and he'd take three days to decide the answer, and then they was always wrong. So he was not really a mentor, but the sponsor. The unwritten rule with a sponsor is you look after me, and I'll look after you. You do my work, and I'll take care of you. Now, it doesn't always work that way. It did work that way for Fred. Exactly, I did all that work, and he did look after me. But later, when I was at Banker's Trust, I worked for another man. In fact, I was there before him. Does it ever happen that you, your boss gets fired, so you get another boss? So the new boss walks in, and he says, your job is to make me look good. And if you make me look good, I'll take care of you. Well, I did, but he didn't. When I needed him, he was off on a hot summer holiday with some girl. Nowhere to be found. And it taught me a lesson, which is you need more than one sponsor. Because if you don't have more, I was lucky, Fred was still there. But you need a few in your, your job, a few people who know how smart you are. And when you're not in the room, they'll talk about how smart you are, or how you should be promoted, or how you should get the next job. So the lesson that I learned is, Mentors talk to you, and sponsors talk about you. And frankly, you need them both. Mm -hmm. I, I want to open this up. We have such a wonderful opportunity to ask further, further questions. So maybe before we do that, because we can, I think we should applaud multiple times tonight. Can we just say thank you to Barbara? And then we'll open it up for her. <laughs> Let's have David facilitate a bit. Excellent. Great, so uh, that, that was certainly very interesting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now have 20 minutes for questions and comments. If you'd like to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. We have a gentleman right in the middle. Please, sir. As a woman leader or a minority leader, do you think you're, you're stronger in that position because you had to fight harder to get there? That's a really good question. I actually do think so. Um, I think that we did have to fight harder. We do, still, every day. Um, and that uh, it's hard, and people, lots of bad things happen along the way. I must say, I didn't really notice them when I was growing up. I mean, I knew that they, when I was in law school, they asked us about the rape and the murders cases just to embarrass us. Mm -hmm. But we did, were embarrassed, but we still went on. But other things happened along the way, and you kind of had to get over it. You couldn't make an issue out of it. And I do think maybe you, maybe you are a bit stronger, because uh, adversity makes you stronger. And it was a bit adverse. But it, we weren't thinking about it. We didn't go around thinking, oh, I'm so persecuted because I'm a woman. We just kind of did it. But you knew, like my mother said, Barbara, you better get the best grades that you possibly can. Because if you don't get good grades, you won't get a job as a lawyer. Because Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first woman on the board of the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, she couldn't get a job as a lawyer. She had to be a legal secretary from the Stanford Law Review. So I think that's probably right. Marianne, anything to add? Or would you okay well, with I was just thinking, as she said, as she said that, I mean, but one of the things I, I particularly admire, Barbara, about you, and, and I see this in, in, in some other fabulous women leaders, is you're right. I mean, it has been, I'm sure, that I, I'm the first woman dean at CAS, but I, it's nothing like some of the oh, first that you've had at all. No, but it, it's made, you're, you're one of the most positive people I know. And I think that that's contagious, and it's important as a leader. 
It's something I see quite a bit in, in the work that I do. I mean, that energy is really important as a leader because you know it's going to influence the other people around you. And you could be taken down with some of these head-banging incidents that you have, but it's clearly not done that. And I think that's something for us all to learn from quite a bit. So thank you. Well, I think it's pretty great to be the first uh, I'll go to the lady right at the front, please. For the, for the new women who want to come into leadership, what would you advise to anybody who wants to come in now? What qualities do we have to have? What do we have to do? First thing I tell them is to get good grades. I really think that getting good grades is very important and getting as much education as you can for women. You asked me that. Because women have this, and I would mm. also tell them to take maths. Because women who take maths earn one third more than other women throughout their life. It's not the truth for men, but it's the truth for women. Second of all, learn financial things. Take engineering. Learn to be, have a career in the profit and loss side of the business, not the strategy side, not the human resource side, because you don't get promoted to be CEO unless you've run a profit and loss. Second of all, what I would say to women is learn to answer when they ask you what you want to be when you grow up. I want to be the boss. I want to be the CEO. I want to be the chairman, not I want to be an actress, thank you very much, or a nurse, or a teacher, even though those are good things to be, but start saying the language of the boss, because women are looked at as helpers, as advisors, as servants, one way or the other, and they learn the language of that, and that's what, what I want them to grow up to be, mm -hmm. is to talk about being the boss, and I will tell you one thing, when, I, when my son was young, I was then a banker, and my husband was a lawyer, and my son was about 10. And the school asked him, when you grow up, I still, they still do that, do you want to be a banker or a lawyer? And my son said, well, I don't want to be a banker. That's a mommy's job. <laughs> <laughs> because we never said that. Mm -hmm. The fact is, we have to teach women to want to be at the height. And when they start using that language, just like me, I said, I want to be a lawyer because my mother told me to. If she told me I wanted to be the boss, I would have said that too. That's what we have to tell them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marianne, any thoughts? Particularly on, on women leaders, what they might need today? Well, I mean, I think about, I certainly think about this with our students and, and our alumni. I mean, I think it's remarkable looking at the tremendous leaps through each generation. But it's kind of the paradox of rising expectations, actually. The more you move, the more you see you need to move. And some of the challenges I think that we face now as women are our own. And we have to think about how do we manage our own confidence and mindsets because some of these comments are in our own heads. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't real structural challenges, but pretend like they're not there. Just, but it's, it's a challenge, I think, ongoing. I think about it, my own daughter, let alone my students. And, we need to think about the language we use, the way that we interact, the micro biases that we have, because we all have them. We all do. I, I mean, I know I do. But I think it's a, it's a broader self-awareness that is probably very critical moving forward, and we can do more with what we have. That's really interesting. What, what's the paradox of, paradox of rising? The paradox of rising expectations is that um, no great social movement has happened uh, among a people that is incredibly impoverished. I mean, you have to, it happens when hope starts to become real, when you start to see movement. So, I mean, I, I'll read this with things in the U.S., you know, women saying we, are the, we have the worst social inequality, uh, social, yeah, inequality in the world, and you're thinking, no, we don't. <laughs> what? But that's this, par I mean, it's that, but you can see that there's so much more to go. I think it's, a, so you get into this interesting kind of bind, but that's okay. You just keep moving. Excellent. We have a question over here, please. I'd like to turn the conversation to leadership of the future. And this question or debate is for both of you. Um, I think the academic debate at the moment is that robo-advisors could help CEOs make more effective decisions and, prove, and improve productivity by up to 20% because there is no emotional bias in those decisions, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to, Barbara, to you, uh, perhaps pose a question about uh, your thoughts on that, how practical it is. And to you, Marianne, perhaps you could uh, expand further on the research you may be doing in this particular area. 
consultants and leaders avoiding bias. Now, no, I want to make sure I heard what, what you said. It, did you say robotic? robotic? That's what I thought. Robotic. Do you want me to start? Do you want me to start? Yeah, because I don't like my answer. Oh, okay, okay. So you, you think of yours. Exactly. Well, like it. So, so my research tends to be out about organizational paradoxes, these interwoven. I mean, I, I think there's this machine human par tension that we can feel. I, I, I think machines are tremendous. I mean, you think my dissertation was on automation, and I thought it was because I grew up with a father who was an operations management professor, and I loved factories, and I loved being with him. And as soon as I started studying machines, I realized the problem wasn't machines. It's always people. Or, and the, the solution is always people. And so I, I think as we're moving into an increasingly digital world, automated world, you know, AI, et cetera, the real question for us is going to be how do we, how do we marry the two so that, so that the machines are really powerful enablers for the human? Because nobody wants to live in a world that is devoid of the human. I mean, that's what we are. So, but I think it'll be a question moving forward, and it will be a challenge for us to understand how we work through that. But we need to be looking at, I hope, the interplay and how we make more of it. So that'll be a question ongoing. So I don't have a great answer, except that it's a, we should look at it as an opportunity. Thank you, Lady Barbara. Do you want to share well, the, the response? Yeah, I was going to say something that I thought you would hate, but Marianne said it already. So, oh. um, which is, <laughs> I don't want robots to replace humans. Oh, no. I think it's a bad idea. I think they should help humans. They should mm -hmm. be like computers. They should advise in a way that they can. But ultimately, I a, think a, I, I think emotionality is a good thing mostly, mm -hmm. not all the time. But B, I'm worried about something much broader than that. I'm worried about joblessness. I'm worried about all mm -hmm. the machines, not the robots particularly. But my problem is, you ask me, I'm going to tell you. Remember when you go to Terminal 5, there used to be a person who looked at your passport and looked at your boarding pass, mm -hmm. checked them and waved you through, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's a machine. Okay, you used to go to the supermarket and there were people at the tills. There's a machine. Very soon there's going to be machines for most low-skilled jobs. And employers and the population is going to think, isn't that great? We can get rid of all these people and we can have machines. But frankly, you're going to have a whole swathe of people who are going to be out of jobs. And they're going to be 50 years old, and they're going to have mortgages and children and families, and nobody's going to invest in sending them back to CAS, which is what they should do, to get retrained, or back to some universities or some high schools to get retrained. And so, yes, I know that sounds like a Luddite, but actually in the old industrial average, the new things made more jobs. But it's quite clear that the new things, for a while at least, aren't going to make more jobs. When they get self-driving cars, there's going to be all the truck drivers are going to be out of jobs. Now, what are we going to do with all those truck drivers? Mm -hmm. We're going to have a massive amount of people who have no jobs. And at the same time, we're going to have every day in the newspapers CEOs making more and more money. So they're going to make $25 million a year, and this man never made 25, or woman 25000 in their life. And they're going to see that, and nobody could spend that amount of money. It's a scorecard. It's just a scorecard. So that disparity of income, plus the fact that there's not going to be jobs for those people, and retraining may come, but not right away, I think that's what revolution is made of. Mm -hmm. And it's frightening me. Mm -hmm. It frightens okay. me all the time. Thank you very much. Do we have a question from somebody at the back over that side? I haven't seen any hands. Excellent. Well done. Lady there, straight in front of the, the microphone, Jack. Um, I'd just like to um, see what your view is on quotas in, uh, to get more women into the boardroom. Quotas, boardrooms. Oh, I have a few. I thought you might. <laughs> I'm a believer. I, I, I'm a believer in quotas. I wasn't always. I didn't think it was a good idea in the beginning, but nothing was happening. I became a partner in 1978 or 9, I can't remember. Whatever it was, it was 1978 or 9, right? It's now 2010, and there's still not very many women partners in the law firm. I mean, come on, it's too long. So what happened to me, as I didn't quite believe in quotas, is I got a call from Vivian Redding, who was the woman in the, in the European Union who was getting this idea of quotas off the ground, she said, come to a meeting in Brussels. And I said, you know, Vivian, I don't really believe in quotas. Please, Barbara, come. So of course, women have to look after women. She wanted me to come. I came. And when I got there, I thought nothing had happened. And sometime you have to kick the ball in order to get it rolling in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so I thought we should have quotas, not forever, but for the beginning. Because what they say about women is they don't, they're not board ready. 
that have never been on a board, they don't know how to be on a board, they're not up for it. Well, of course, nobody will put you on a board if you don't have any experience, so it's catch-22. You can't get on a board, you have no experience, therefore you can't get on a board. So I went for quotas. Now I know that the UK went for targets, not quotas. And I got some criticism from some of my friends in the women's movement because, oh, Barbara, how could you do that? We're for targets. And now they say, well, we got there, 30% non-execs, right? I promise you, they would never have gotten there without the threat of quotas right behind <laughs> the targets. They knew absolutely that if they didn't do something in the UK, the quotas were going to come. So I think they have a good role, not forever, but to get the ball rolling in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Marianne, any comments? Well, I think it's a really challenging question, to be honest, and I'm not trying to evade it. But I, I always have this memory in the back of my head. When I was, when I was in high school, I, I did a lot of babysitting for the dean of admissions of Stanford. I grew up in Palo Alto. And I remember, you know, as I'm starting to think about going to college, going to university, I asked him, how do you, how do, you do this at Stanford as the dean? He said, uh, he was the dean of admissions and, of the university. And he said, well, I mean, we get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of basically perfect scores. And, I, and you know, I'm having my heart palpitating as he's telling me about this. And I said, so what do you do? And he said, well, you're really, you're building a class. You're building a cohort, and you think about what it really. These are all subjective decisions, and how do you build the group that is going to be setting the tone and driving the culture? And and so I guess even as a leader today, I have that in the back. Of, I mean, we're always making subjective decisions. Don't tell me these are objective. I don't care what your metrics are. You're always weighing. And what's the out? What are you really trying to build? And then I think it's now. Let's look at. Let's say what do what do we think? are the key pieces. And it might mean exactly that. Shapes, sizes, you know, what do we think are the differences that we need to make ourselves stronger? And then use that. And then that's a framework within which we can do much better, much stronger. So. Great, thank you very much. Uh, gentleman at the back, please. I want to go back to the quest, this sort of discussion about AI and, and joblessness. Yeah. Um, from um, and weirdly enough involved in sort of AI and things like that which potentially could be replacing jobs in companies the question I have is do you think it's the responsibility with joblessness of the state or the go or companies or is it a social sort of responsibility thing to get involved in joblessness and to stop that because that could be a serious problem in the next 30 40 years I do I think the government has to I think employers have to the government has to society has to I think we cannot have a society where people don't work. Remember I told you my mother got dementia at 88 when she stopped working? Well, if she'd stopped working at 50, she probably would have got it then too. There's gonna be a whole group, and we're gonna live longer. So this is all happening at the worst time. Everybody's gonna live till 90, and they're gonna be out of a job at 50 or 60, and there's, and there's no pension money in the state to pay them a pension. And anyway, I was in Washington this weekend and I was sitting next to a noted economist named Larry Summers. Did anybody ever hear of yeah. him? He's a big <laughs> shot, right? And La so I'm talking to Larry Summers about my pet problem, which I just told you. And he said, well, Barb, we know it's not a problem. We can just give a universal amount of money. Every citizen can be given a certain amount of money. I think that is a terrible idea. Yeah, that's a giant you know, welfare state. That's they do that in, in the Arab countries. I'm, I advise there, okay. some of them. People don't do anything. They sit and no. they either get drunk, they take drugs, they have they violence in the streets because they're so bored to death. Tears giving people money is a bad idea. Then his second idea is, well, we give them shorter work week. They'll have more leisure. Well, frankly, they're not going to need money to use their leisure or else they'll be giving them the money to lie in their bed. I think it's a terrible idea. And I think unless we start worrying about retraining people now, not smart ones like you guys, you can all get yourselves retrained. Remember my guys. My people are the lower middle class, not the middle middle class. They are people who are not educated, and they need jobs just like everybody else needs jobs in order to be really important, feel, feel self-important. And giving them money is not going to give them self-confidence. Mm -mm. mm -mm. uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you, can, you can have all sorts of there are all sorts of obviously big wicked problems that we face. I don't think there's anything more wicked than in a 
the social inequality, income inequality. I think it's, as you said, it's a revolution waiting and it's all of our responsibilities to be looking at this. I also think, uh, there's some interesting, uh, I read a book recently by Diamandis on kind of this abundance mindset. And you know, you can have a view as a leader of, when you think about resources, this assumption is, you know, how do I slice the pie? Like thinner and thinner. Or you could have abundance mindset, which is much more about how do you grow the pie? How, how do you fuel entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship from the time you have from young children all the way through? I mean, this has to be something I think that we're thinking about. It doesn't matter what the program is that you're working on, because what we're going to need is more people that are in this group thinking about how do we start new opportunities, grow new businesses, grow, because actually we can solve this. With, I mean, look at the incredible changes that have happened just, I mean, the, the rate of change is accelerating at a remarkable. So we can actually grow our way out of this, but it's going to take more entrepreneurs, more innovation, uh, I think a mindset of creativity that we fuel at every level to say, we have to solve this, we all do. That's my little soapbox. Thank you very much. And um, just before I go, there's actually a, an email just come in from one of our ID members hmm. in Belgium. And he says, apparently, there's something happened with respect to Brexit today. Is there any comments on Brexit? <laughs> from either of you? Oh, wow. Apparently. All right, so the IOD oh, position. Before the referendum, 60% of our members were in favor of remain. 30% were in favor of leave, and about 10% didn't register. Now we have Brexit, and actually, we're dealing with it as a membership. And 40% of our members are concerned and nervous, but about 60% are more upbeat. Our members, which are small and medium-sized businesses mostly, about 40% of them have a relationship to the EU. They either have EU people working for them, or they, can, they sell into the supply chain, or the supply chain in Europe sells into them. So they have a relationship with Europe. But actually, overwhelmingly, today, people are not as worried as we thought they were. They're optimistic. All the indicators mm -hmm. are up. They think they can sort the problem. Some are delaying decisions, but many people are looking at the, the opportunities that may and probably will occur. You know, the EU was founded 60 years ago, but our country, Britain, was a trading nation in the 1600s. We managed to be a trading nation without the EU, and we will be again. Mm -hmm. And we have resilience here, we have very creative people, and our members are feeling that we have to get behind it, we have to learn how to deal with countries that are not in the EU. Actually, I was at a lecture this morning, and Asia is viewing the UK in a lot of ways more attractive now than it ever was before, mm -hmm. because they can make their own bilateral mm -hmm. agreements. So, yes, it's dysfunctional, but we're going to learn how to function around it. And we're optimistic. Yeah, I could much. not agree more. Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may, may we thank you.